It's kind of funny that you guys invited me to speak about breaking the rules because most of my life uh, I've followed the rules. Um, you got to understand, I'm a uh, very anxious person. Anxiety. Do you guys, who here is anxious in general? Yeah, okay. I'm a very anxious person. Um, I'd say that I've, most of my life, I've gone through life with you know, 75 to 85 percent of my moment-to-moment -moment brain power dedicated towards worrisome obsessions, right, that I can't, I can't pull my mind away from. So things like the rules really comforted me. Like, I like rules. Um, when I was in school, you know, doing my homework, getting A's, uh, playing, playing tennis, um, winning at tennis, being the um, you know class president or or editor of the paper, these things uh, gave me structure and allowed me to kind of free my brain from all of that anxiety. Right? If I were if I was doing well in school and if I were if I was doing all these activities, it meant I was on the right path and I was and I was doing well and I didn't have to worry about that stuff. But that kind of Playing by those rules only work up until, up until a certain point, right? And that's the point at which you graduate from college. Then all of a sudden, those rules don't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if, you know, you, you're getting good grades or anything. And so after school, I kind of didn't know what to do. So I went out to California, to Los Angeles, as if, you know, that were the prerequisite to becoming a film director, right? That's what I thought the rules were. Well, if I want to be a director, I need to go out to Los Angeles. So I went out to Los Angeles, and what I quickly realized was that once you're, when you want to be a film director, there are no rules. There's no prerequisite to get there. You don't need a college degree. You don't need a high school degree. You don't need to have ever made a film before. You could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You could be a high school dropout. Um, it doesn't matter. It's just a total free-for-all. And things like a resume and any of those things, none of, that, none of that matters. So it's been 15 years since then. Okay, and my adult life has basically been an education in figuring out what rules I don't have to follow. Okay, so let's just put a pin in all that for a second and talk about storytelling. Okay, what are the rules underneath the rules? There you go. Okay, storytelling. So I got out to LA and I took the first job that would pay me so I could pay my rent and that was editing. And now, I started editing when I was 15 years old, and I've been doing it now for over 20 years. So I've done kind of more than my 10,000 hours of editing. And once you do that, you hone in on kind of the foundational rules of storytelling, right? These are the rules underneath the rules of storytelling. And they allow you to tell a good, compelling, emotionally satisfying movie story and without having to adhere to all the other little rules. And I basically want to share with you guys the, my three favorite storytelling uh, rules. And ultimately, I want to use those rules and apply them to life. OK. Um, OK, so these are my three favorite storytelling rules. And they all start with one basic question. And that is, what is a movie? What is it? I mean, what, what is a movie? Is it, is it 90 minutes to two hours with a beginning, middle, and end? Is it three acts? Is it five acts? You guys are engineer students, a lot of you guys, so you're interested in how things work, right? What is, what are, what is the underlying fundamental structure of a movie? This is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And I actually, I came up with an answer, okay? So, in essence, for me, this is what a movie is. A movie is a series of dramatic questions. Okay, how will it end? Who is that guy? Will he get the girl? Will Van Damme win the Kumite? Will Nemo be reunited with his family? Here, throw out a movie. Who's got a movie? Just throw out the name of any movie. What? Titanic, right. Will, 
will their love be successful? Will he get the girl? Will they survive? Right? You're, wh why do you stay to the end of that movie? That's the question you ask. We'll throw out another movie. Fight Club. Will, will Edward Norton's character overcome his, his pathetic nature and, and kind of become the man that he wants to be? Right? Some, one more. American Beauty. American Beauty. Why? How will Kevin Spacey's character end up dying? Because he says it at the beginning, I'm, in, a, in less than a year, I'll be dead. So all of a sudden, you're thinking, well, how is he going to die? Well, what's going to lead to him dying? Right, so you know what this is? All these questions that are at the heart of movies that make movies work? It's anxiety. This is how movies work. All these questions make, they plant little in anxieties inside of all of us that hook us and keep us watching to the end. Every movie at the very beginning asks a number of questions, right? And those questions won't get tied up until the very end. So every movie kind of promises that they'll answer all these questions at the end of the movie, which is why this, this is how you get sucked into watching a movie when, when, you're, when you're watching TV or flipping channels and you come across a movie and you're in the middle of it, right? And it's a shitty movie. You don't even like it. But you can't stop watching. You'll sit there for the rest of the afternoon and watch that movie because you need to see how it ends. How will it end? Who did it? Why? Why did they do it? Right? And then the, the climax of a movie, right, the big finish of a movie, this is generally when the, the big question of the movie gets answered, right? But the movie's not just over then. Because then there are a bunch of little questions that come, after, that come afterwards. Oh, well, what's going to happen to his wife? Or, or you know, oh, what's going to happen to them now? Where are they going to go live? And that's the resolution or denouement. So that's the first rule is that a uh, film is a series of dramatic questions. Okay, second rule. Flow is king. Okay, so what does that mean? People are not data processors. Okay, I see a lot of uh, young filmmakers, documentary filmmakers especially, and editors make this mistake, right? They assume that if they have their characters say everything that they want the audience to hear, that the audience will somehow digest it all and receive it. They'll hear it and they'll understand it and, and they've done their job as filmmakers, right? This is not how it works. To show evidence of this, I've been making a television show for the last seven years. We've done over 100 episodes, okay? And we have a lot of fans. And a lot of them come up to me. They run up to me and they go, Neve! Neve is the name of the other guy on the show, okay? No one ever says my name. And it's not because they don't, it's not because they haven't paid attention to the show. It's that things like, details like my name aren't well recorded. When people watch a movie or a TV show, the things that they remember are the emotions that they felt while, they're, while they were watching it. They don't remember the information so much as they do the experience of watching it, right? They remember the anxiety. They remember the, the laughs. They remember if they cried. They remember if things got tense. They remember the relief, right? That's what people remember. And that is flow. And, and flow is basically, it's musical as opposed to rational, right? There, we, remember, we remember the music of something as opposed to, you know, the A to B to C of it. This is the ebb and flow of energy, right? So when we talk about flow, we talk about it kind of in the language of, of sex and seduction. We, we, re, we remember suspense, anticipation, acceleration, deceleration, climax, right? Basically, it's an emotional playlist. It's kind of like it's kind of like if you were making a playlist. If you were a DJ, you're not going to put three slow songs in a row, right? And you're not going to put three fast songs in a row. That you'd be a bad DJ, right? You wouldn't. When you when you make a playlist for someone, it goes like this, and that's what a good story does. It's also kind of similar to. You know the phenomenon of like when you're in a car, right? If you're, going, if you're in a car and you're moving at a constant speed and you're going dead straight, 
you don't actually feel any movement. It's boring. But if the car is, you, you only feel that you're in a car when it's speeding up or when it's slowing down or if it's making a left turn or a right turn. And basically when you're, when you're in a movie, you want to always constantly feel like you're in motion. Of course, if you make a 90 degree turn and you go too fast, you're screwed. Then the car will flip over and you've lost it. But basically, if you prioritize flow, the audience will go along the ride with you. Third rule, okay, first rule was uh, film is a series of questions. Second rule was, uh, was flow is king. Third rule is energy is greater than information. Basically, when you're calling for moments or clips or you're trying to make, you're trying to make someone fall in love with a character or even, or even just understand a character, you, you want to follow this, that, that energy is more important than information. A lot of young filmmakers will do this. They'll, they'll have a character sit on screen and kind of tell you everything they're about. So when you're editing, you actually kind of learn to look for the, for the parts where people light up, you know, where they tell a funny story or they, they refer to something offhand or they talk to someone else, but it's like where, where their face brightens up, where the, all of a sudden they have energy. Right? You, put, you put this kind of like energy filter on where you're just scanning all the footage for energy as opposed to information. Because information, we don't feel information. It's, it's intellectual. It's boring. We want, we want those moments where people light up, okay? It's kind of like, uh, is anyone here like an art student? Any, anyone here draw, sketch? Okay. Uh, an art an art student friend of mine once told me that if you're doing a sketch of someone, the best thing you can do is actually, instead of just like drawing an outline, like, oh, that's the nostril, that's the eye, and you're doing it all like in lines, the best thing you could do is actually just draw the dark parts, the, where the light is falling, all the, the dark patches, and then leave all the kind of the bright patches blank. And all of a sudden, if you just kind of look at things through that prism, you'll get a much more accurate representation of that person. You'll get a much more accurate portrait at the end of it. And I think that's the same way when you're editing and it comes to energy, right? Energy is greater than information. Okay, back to life. So let's try to apply these three rules to life. This was actually really helpful because, again, I wake up every morning freaking out about my life. What am, I, what am I doing with my life? Why, why am I so slow at making anything? You know, what am I going to be when I grow up? Am I grown up now? What's the, you know, like, why, why can't I be happy? Why, why am I so ungrateful? You can ask my wife, I, wherever she is. I wake up every morning very anxious. And so I was hoping that maybe taking some of these rules that I've spent so much time thinking about in regards to storytelling and I wondered if I applied them to my life, could I figure something out? Could I figure out a way to be less anxious? Okay. So dramatic questions, right? If, if a movie is composed of dramatic questions that, that stir up anxiety in us, maybe I should just stop asking those questions. What am I going to be when I grow up? Am I grown up now? Am I going to be a good father? Am I, why am I so slow? Why can't I just be like this guy who does four movies a year, right? Those are all questions. And unlike a movie, those questions will never be definitively answered. Like, the reason why we love movies is because it'll take a dramatic question, an anxious question, it'll work it from every angle, and at the end, it'll give you a definitive answer that will deliver catharsis, resolution, and ultimately peace, and we feel good. But Life is not like a movie. It's more like a really long TV series that asks a number of big dramatic questions that never really get fully answered. Life is fundamentally frustrating, right? And you don't get those answers. So, if I were to apply this rule to my own life, it would be, well, let's just stop asking those questions. So now, when I catch myself asking these anxious questions in the morning, what am I going to be when I grow up? Am I grown up now? Why am I so slow? I stop, take a deep breath, remember that I should just stop asking these questions, and I put one foot in front of the other, and I move on. 
and it actually has been really helpful. I came up with this a few weeks ago, and I've been trying it, and, it, and it's great. So if you're anxious, maybe just stop asking questions to yourself, okay? So that's the supplying the first rule. Okay, second rule. Have faith in flow, okay? Flow is king. So if we were to apply this rule to life, one thing we could do is take the pressure off of ourselves to make plans, right? That five-year plan that you have, I want to be I want to be doing this by the time I'm 25. I want to be doing this by the time I'm 30. And then I'm going to be doing this and doing that. Fuck that. That's not a recipe for happiness, okay? You know, life is weird. And we, it has a weird musical logic to it, right? And things, and things take weird turns. And you've got to prioritize that. Let the flow... Let the flow take you a little bit, right? When you come to a moment where you're not sure which way to go, listen to what life is trying to tell you. Listen to what the next chapter of the emotional playlist should be. If you've just done something really intense, maybe take a break for a little bit. If, you're, if, you've, um, if you've just taken a break for a long time, maybe now is the time to kind of turn up, turn up the heat and, and, and really get intense about something, right? Enjoy the ride. Be on that roller, coast, that roller coaster. Get in touch with the flow that is your life. Um, life is not that straight line, that A, that A to B to C to D. If you did that, it would, your life would be kind of boring. It would be like being in that car going str dead straight at a constant speed. And what fun would that be? That wouldn't be a ride at all. And lastly, follow the energy. Right, how do we do this, how do we do this in, our, in our lives? Um, energy is something you feel in your body, right? And unlike your mind, the body doesn't lie. And so, you know, follow the energy. You know, have you guys seen The Predator? You know that movie, The Predator? Okay, well, The Predator sees things like this, okay? It's very, it's very not intellectual. The Predator just sees, like, body energy, Right, body heat. And this is kind of what, when I'm editing, I'm kind of like, this is how I see things, right? I see, like, when, when people light up, that's a moment that I want to use. And when people kind of get bored or just uh, start talking like that, that's, that's something to cut. So in life, put on this filter. You know, it, it helps also when, you know, whether you're choosing your romantic partner or your business partner or your mentor or your friends, you know, go, go with people who energize you, right, as opposed to people who deflate you, right? It doesn't matter if you can have an intellectual discussion with them about Proust for three hours. If it leaves you feeling deflated afterwards, then maybe that's not someone you want to have in your life. Uh, my wife and I um, didn't speak the same language f pretty much for the first three years of our, of our time together, and our whole relationship was just based on the great energy that we had when, when we were together. Um, and it's worked out so far, I think. <laughs> um, the truth is, though, that making anything is really fucking hard. Whether it's, whether it's a building or, or a, a school project or a movie, making anything is hard. And if, and if you don't love it, if you don't have a lot of passion and energy for that thing, if, if talking about it and doing it doesn't energize you, then you're not going to make something good. The things, the things that I've done purely for money are the worst things I've ever done. I, I would be embarrassed to even show them to you. But the things I've done where I've gotten paid nothing or got paid very little, where the budget was nothing, those, thing, those are the best things I've ever done, mainly because I was doing it out of my own love and passion for it and for no other reason. So if you're doing things because it's what your parents want you to do or because the, you know, it's going to pay you well or because you know, maybe you'll get some prestige at the end of it, that'll only take you so far. Your heart just won't be in it and you won't be, you won't be lit up. So in closing, you want to find things that turn you on, right? that light you up. And you want to find other people in your life that light you up too. And, and again, it's like, it's this follow the energy thing. And it, 
And every time I do that and I get out of my head and I just pay attention to what's going on in my body and I try to, f try to feel what, where life is pointing me and what the next chapter in the emotional playlist of my life should be and who I should surround myself with, if I focus on the flow and if I, if I focus on choosing energy over data or over information or over reason, then it kind of works out. So anyway, that's my talk. Thank you very much.